Our Bible word is Hebrews 6 verses 11 to 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The Epistle to the Hebrews. According to some early church sources, it was attributed to the Apostle Paul. For example, already in the second century onwards, all of Paul's writings were collected together. And for some, this epistle was also added to this collection of Pauline epistles. But others in the early church also said they don't know who wrote this epistle. And for example, the early church father Origen, he said, but as to who actually wrote the epistle, God knows the truth of the matter. And that is quoted by Eusebius in his church history. So already in the early church there was question mark, who wrote this? And today scholars and theologians generally accept that Paul did not write this epistle. Because the language is too different. The Greek grammar and style is too different. Also the theology is quite different if you compare it to Paul's epistles. So who wrote this? God knows who wrote this epistle. But, and also where he wrote it, for whom, we also do not know because there's no real clues in the text. Maybe to people or Christians in Rome, because there's this reference to, to, to Rome towards the end of the epistle, etc. But exactly who wrote it and to where, which Christians this was aimed, we, we do not know. But what we can know is that it was aimed at Jewish Christians. And maybe it was written before the temple was destroyed, around 65 AD or so, because the author also writes as if the temple is still standing, the sacrificial system of the temple is still operating. But it could also have been written quite after this, or after this time, or after the temple was destroyed. So it was aimed at the Jewish Christian audience. And what we do know was is that they were being persecuted, they were being harassed. And there are different phases that you can recognize in the epistle what this community has gone through. And the earliest phase is, is where they were persecuted, they were harassed, their property was plundered. But at this time they remained faithful, not just to the Christian faith, but also to each other. And this we can go read in chapter 10 verses 32 to 34. If we go there, the author writes, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you become companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and in during possession for yourselves in heaven. So yeah, the author writes to this earlier time period. He himself was in prison. They came to visit him also. And these Christians, their property was plundered. The city officials were ever turned a blind eye and, and there were people around in the community. And they were targets of abuse. And now, a little while later, this kind of harassment has continued and it's difficult. And some started getting tired and they started withdrawing from coming to Christian fellowship. And we can also read this in chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 where the author writes there, Let us consider one another, and in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. So he says here, you are, some are holding back, some are staying away from the Christian assemblies. And also some, they are still in prison and it's becoming a burden to look after those in prison. Also in chapter 13 verses 3, the author writes about the present situation of believers. He says they remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you, you yourselves are in the body also. So even at the time of writing, there were those imprisoned. So it was a difficult situation. Yeah, people are losing their faith. They are withdrawing. There are those in prison. 
the community is still being harassed on a continual basis. So now our author writes this epistle. It's actually more like a sermon. It's actually more like a homily. He's giving them encouragement. If we go right to the end of the epistle, to chapter 13, verses 22, he writes about, receive this word of exhortation. So this is to encourage them to, so that they don't withdraw from the faith, etc. So now he also addresses them. He says, now again I must instruct you. You've become like children. Now we must teach you again all the first principles. If you go to chapter 5, verses 12, from verses 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So the author also says, now you, it's like we're back at the beginning. You are withdrawing and you're losing your commitment to Christ. Now we must start from the beginning and teach you again. So that was a difficult situation. And also in chapter 11, for example, our author encourages these Christians. Remember the, the examples of the Old Testament. These, the patriarchs, those other figures he refers to. How they remained faithful to God. How they, how they endured. Even though they did not receive the promise of rest that God has given to his people. So it's generally, this is a word of exhortation to Christians. Remain faithful. And the author also writes to convince these Christians Christ is superior to what they've known before. Do not go back to the Judaism that you knew. That is past now. The time of the new covenant has come. Christ is superior in several ways. And it's Christ is superior to the prophets, to the angels. He is superior to Moses, Israel's lawgiver. He's superior to Joshua, and Christ is also superior to the Aaronic priesthood and the whole Levitical sacrificial system. That was where people made or brought their sacrifices of atonement. That's where their sins were also removed through the priests who brought or helped them with the sacrifices in the temple. But Christ is superior to this. Christ brought his once for all sacrifice. We go read also in chapter 10 verses 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In other words, Jesus, he made the sacrifice. So it's, the work is done. No more sacrifices needs to be made. That's why Jesus is superior to this priesthood that operated in the temple. Also very important in the book of Hebrews is that it emphasizes the role of Jesus as the high priest. He replaces the old high priest. Jesus is now the mediator between God and the people. He is the one who offered himself. He, made, he brought his own body as a sacrifice of atonement. And because of that, he has become the high priest. Also the one who now is seated at God's right hand and who intercedes on behalf of God's people. So that's quite important. Jesus is superior to what these Jewish Christians have known before. And he is the high priest. He's now enthroned in heaven. He's seated at God's right hand, who now intercedes on behalf of God's people. So now if you look at our textual context. Now chapters 4 verses 14 to 6 verses 20. It focuses on Jesus being the high priest. And our author writes about Jesus being this high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And if we now move in narrower to chapter 6, if you look there from verses 1 to 8, the author explains there that no second beginning is possible. Remember he's writing here to an audience, there's a threat of them drawing back from the Christian faith. And he says, if you go away, if you deliberately commit apostasy, you cannot come back. And then from verses 9 to 12, that's our most immediate literary unit. It's 
encouragement to persevere. And then verses 13 to 10, that speaks about the steadfastness of God's promises. Now, if we go to the beginning of chapter 6, the author says there, it's no point now, let's to go over everything again that, I've, uh, that you know already. And what is this that they know already? And as Jews, they would have been familiar with this already, even before they came to the Christian faith. It's these rudiments or the most basic elements of faith. For example, it's repentance from dead works. It's about faith in God. It's instructions about ritual washings. It's the laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and also of eternal judgment. These elements, as Jews, they would have already been familiar with it. So the basis was already there for them to come to the Christian faith. So the author says, there's no point going over this again. Because you know this already. And also there's a danger now that the Christian content of these elements may become lost. Because there's a threat of them withdrawing from the Christian faith. So the author writes, we must now move on. Let's move on. Maybe that will help you to come along, to come to new understanding, to come back to Christ. And the author wrote about Jesus being this high priest, who's, who's a true high priest, who's replaced the old order, the old sacrificial system of the Old Testament and as it existed then. And he says, if you know this, and if you've come to know Christ, and you stop, then there's no second chance for you, according to the author. You've committed deliberate apostasy, you've returned your back on Christ, is the equivalent of crucifying, like those others who crucified Jesus, because you reject Him. Because those who rejected Him, crucified Him. So you yourselves, in a sense, are also crucifying the Lord again by you going back from Christ. And he also says part of this they can't turn back is because they've already tasted these heavenly gifts. They've already experienced baptism. They've already received the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. And they've already experienced the laying on of hands. That's when people receive the Holy Spirit. And they're going to lose all this now if they de deliberately turn their back on God. And they will be like those who do not produce fruit. Now, if we come to our media textual unit, that's verses 9 to 12. This is an encouragement for them to persevere in the faith. If we go to verse 9, the author writes, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So he, he's, he's actually saying, I, I don't think you are like, going to be like these people who are going to withdraw and turn their back on Christ. In verse 10 it says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Because He says, you are still here. You have ministered to the saints. Remember, many of them were imprisoned. Many were, their property was plundered, etc. And these Christians, they've ministered to fellow Christians. So he says, you will not be like the people that withdraw because you're here and you are showing works of righteousness. This Christian life of faith has, is having an effect among you. And now we come to our Bible word. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So in other words, continue as you've started with the zeal that you had in the beginning. Let it also be now. And also verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So, especially in chapter 11, the author will give many examples of the Old Testament, of people who showed courage and endurance, and they trusted God, and they had faith in God. And also, with that comes also reward and blessings. So be like these people. Endure in your faith. Do not become sluggish. Maintain your zeal as you had in the beginning. Because if, if you turn your back on Christ and apostatize from Him, there's no coming back. There's no second chances according to the author.
So let's maintain the zeal. The zeal we had in the beginning, let it also be like, be like that today.